So happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs> a Course in Miracles says the resurrection is the denial of death, being the assertion of life. Thus is all the thinking of the world reversed entirely. Life is now recognized as salvation and pain and misery of any kind perceived as hell. Love is no longer feared, but gladly welcomed. Idols have disappeared, and the remembrance of God shines unimpeded across the world. Christ's face is seen in every living thing, and nothing is held in darkness apart from the light of forgiveness. There is no sorrow still upon the earth. The joy of heaven has come upon it. That is the meaning of Easter. Today and every day, jubilance. The holy beckons us from the tomb of our ego to deny the death that it offers us, to reverse its selfish ways of thinking and being in the world, to deny the hatred that it offers disguised as love, to step out of the pain and misery that its, that its kind of thinking brings to us. So on this glorious morning and every morning, the idols of this world disappear and God's love shines across the world. And if we, jubilants, live in this resurrected state, we will see the world differently. We will see the face of the holy in every living thing. We will be able to see through the ego's sorrow and know that heaven is in this moment. And if we're willing to roll away the stone of the ego, we can step into it. This jubilance is our purpose in life, to overcome the ego's tomb to emerge as the people that we truly are, truly alive in the world. And we can live a resurrected day, life every day, by removing all the barriers to love that we have created and become those clear channels of extension of God's love into the world. And that's the kind of resurrected living that ought to make you say, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Please ride there. In the weeks before my 20-year-old cat, George left this bodily existence, I noticed something very different when I gazed into his beautiful green eyes. Maybe the change was in me and not him, but I saw something there that I had not seen before in his previous 20 years of life. I saw eternity. I swear Whenever I peered into those eyes for more than a moment, I got a glimpse of that field of eternity that Rumi talks about in his fa famous poem, out there beyond all the right doing and wrongdoing, that place of unity where we all still dwell as one spirit. And maybe, maybe it's because I knew George was going to be moving into that field himself in a very short time, and, and maybe he knew it too. I like to think maybe he was giving me a final gift, a glimpse of where we all will meet again in that infinite, united field where we are all one spirit. George reminded me of how metaphysical teacher and author Joel Goldsmith describes the time that we spend in this bodily realm. As I said, we're all here experiencing in this moment a parenthesis in eternity. We are eternal spirits. We were never born, we will never die, but when we enter this physical, ego-driven world, a parenthesis opens up in the eternal timeline and it closes when we physically leave. And it's important to know that we're living in a parenthesis in eternity because if we truly understand that, then we realize there's no reason to fear death in this bodily life because in capital R reality, death doesn't even exist. Our bodies, like, like my poor George's, they're going to grow old. They'll die. They'll return to the dust that we came from. But our spirit, that eternity within each of us, it never, ever dies. So in George's eyes, I saw him in eternity. And while my grief over the loss of his beautiful, furry, purring, and warm body snuggled up against mine, while that is still very real, seeing that eternity within his eyes helped me to know that George, the eternal energy that I named George in this parentheses, he remains with me because he and I were both part of that eternal field of unity. I'm still there. He's still there. 
He's just outside the parentheses now. But the ego wants us to see death as the final act, something that obliterates us forever because the ego sees this world as the be-all and end-all of existence. This is why we fear death so much. But Jesus was clear that death in this world, it doesn't mean anything. When you look at eternity, we can lay our lives down in this world, and we can close the parentheses here, but we can always take it back up again. We can open up another parenthesis in eternity. We can come and go in this physical world all we want. But if you don't believe in physical reincarnation, and that, some people don't, and that's fine. But there is another way to look at Jesus' words and dispel what may even be a bigger fear within our own heart and mind, <laughs> a bigger fear than physical death, and that is the fear of dying to all the ways that the ego seeks to limit us and shame us and threatens to bring suffering and despair into our world while we are, are in these particular set of parentheses. Why else, if you Google it, number one fear of human beings, why else would our number one fear in this bodily life be what? Yeah. No, it's not. Being forgotten. Public speaking. <laughs> yeah, public speaking. <laughs> that is our number one Fear is public speaking because you know why? Do you know why? Because the ego tells us that the worst kind of possible death that we can face in this world is death of status, death of respect, death of recognition, death of shame or blame or guilt falling on us. And if we stand up and speak to other people, we open ourselves up to all of that. Everybody in this room is judging me in some way. I hope it's nice. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> and I'll never know, exactly. I mean, unless some, well, I don't think. <laughs> Thank Beth for that. I never would have picked this shirt for myself. <laughs> it's peachy. It's peachy. Right, because I'm a peachy kind of person. But anyway. <laughs> On this plane of existence, the only death that really scares us are the many deaths that our ego can experience. The protection of our ego is what leads us to the many, many emotional crucifixions that we undergo. And the fear of ego's death is one of our biggest barriers to allowing the love of the holy to become how we truly live in this world. And for people who don't think that, that A Course in Miracles has a sense of humor, I'm telling you, during our Course in Miracles uh, discussion groups, we read and we laugh because the Course is funny. And today's reading ends with a punchline. It really does because it's talking about don't make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. The only message of the crucifixion is that, that, that you can overcome the cross. And it says, until then, you are free to crucify yourself as often as you choose. <laughs> I mean, that, that's funny. Because that's what we're going to do. You're like, okay, thanks. Thanks. Appreciate the, appreciate the advice. Now I'm going to go suffer a little more. Because <laughs> that's what we do here. And we're protecting our ego when we suffer. When we learn to let go of the defense of the ego, A Course in Miracles says we will take that last useless journey to the cross. We can stop crucifying ourselves. The death of the ego in today's, script, today's reading says... It's already accomplished. It truly has no power over us except what we give to it. The ego has no business running our lives, and when we take it out of the driver's seat, we are free to join the resurrection into our new life, living from that higher divine self. Until you do so, of course, says, your life is indeed wasted. It merely reenacts the separation, the loss of power, the futile attempts of the ego at reparation, and finally the crucifixion of the body or death. Such repetitions are endless until they are voluntarily given up. So jubilance, what are you crucifying yourself about today? Are you listening to the ego that tells you that dying to the world's opinion of you is the worst thing that could ever happen? Are you afraid to die to the shame, the blame, the guilt, the grievances of your ego, thinking they're the only things that keep you truly alive in the world? Are you afraid to lay down this life of ego and pick up your true life 
of divinity. If you are, I invite you to gaze deeply into George's infinite eyes for a moment, or into the eyes of any animal, because that's the beauty of George and all of my animals. He has no ego. Reva might. We might. <laughs> yeah, she's loaded. <laughs> she's a poodle. So poodles, poodles are all about ego, that's right. But most animals, they have no ego. Instead, they just see eternity with their infinite eyes. And the good news is this morning, jubilance, we can be like George. Breathe deeply. The very best way to be like George or any other animal, maybe other than Reva, and like Cece here, <laughs> it's to live as fully in the present moment as you can. Animals have no egos. They don't sit around wondering if someone likes them. If you are my dog, Pax, you assume everybody likes you. <laughs> animals don't hold grudges. Even the most abused of animals can regain trust in humans that show them affection and care. To be like George, to be able to see eternity through infinite eyes, is to live fully here in this moment until our body dies. This is why I think so many people were attracted to Jesus in his day, because I think when they looked into Jesus' eyes, they saw eternity. The eyes of their religious leaders revealed only judgment and grievance. But Jesus was different. He looked beyond the fear. He looked beyond judgment. He looked beyond grievance and shame in this physical world, and he saw the eternity in everyone's eyes around him. The Christian religion may be founded on this man and his teachings, but Jesus clearly knew that we are all one spirit having disparate and divergent bodily experiences. In today's reading, he even says, I have other sheep that don't belong to this fold. I must bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd. It is, he says, for this reason, to remind us that we're all one flock with one shepherd, no matter which flock or fold we find ourselves in the moment, that he laid down his life, both physically and egoically, to prove that this ego-powered world has no true power over us. Goldsmith echoes that when he says, no spiritual truth is true about life as lived in the parentheses. So we have to go beyond the parentheses and realize that consciousness is now revealing itself in form. That's you guys. That's all of us. Consciousness revealing itself in form. If we think of form as the life, however, we're in parentheses. So if we think of this form, this is me and this is my life, and it's the only one I got and I got to defend it from everybody else, then we're still in the parentheses. But if we think of form as the life, we are in the parentheses, but if we see form as life expressing itself, we see our lives as an expression of God's love in the world, living through us, living through our form, then it must go on and on forever, even if it has to create new forms every hour, even if more babies have to be born for that holy love to get expressed through us into the world. So if we're living our life and we go, oh, this is nothing special. I'm just going to live till I die. I'm going to work. I'm going to get blah, 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 blah. I'm going to, and I got to defend what's mine. We're just in the parentheses. But if we see with those infinite eyes, if we see that we, these bodies, these vessels, they're just here to communicate God's love, then we understand we are eternity. We are not the parentheses. Whenever we think of the forms around us as holding the meaning of life, we are stuck in the ego. Whenever we see those forms around us, though, as expressions of divine love, walking around in suits of flesh, then we see outside the parentheses. Then we see eternity with infinite eyes because eternity, Goldsmith says, is a continuous now. Ah, but you may be thinking, what if my experience of now is painful? Well, of course, that's part of our fear of death. 
And it's why beca death becomes a barrier because we think if we get all spiritual and we live in our higher divine self, it's all going to be puppies and rainbows and unicorns and we're not going to experience pain anymore. And George would tell you that you are wrong. In his last days, George was in terrible pain. He would experience episodes where all he could do was just lie down and he appeared to be near death and about a half an hour or so would pass and he'd spring back up to life. Unsteady on his feet, but he'd eat and enjoy the world again. So pain, jubilance, it is a part of this bodily life. It always will be until we lay this body down and close this particular parenthesis. And Jesus didn't flee from that pain. He welcomed it, not as someone who sacrificed to save us from our sins, but as a way to show us that death has no power in this world. We are eternal, and though we cling to the old rugged cross, which just means we cling fiercely to this egoic life in the body, if we can wrap our minds around the reality of our infinity, we start to cling less and less tightly to this bodily existence, and we embrace our true, infinite, eternal, divine nature. <coughs> so I invite you, Jubilance, to use your pain. It's here to teach you something. Use your tragedies, use your suffering as a bell of mindfulness to return to the present moment, to see this world for what it is, a parenthesis in eternity. This physical, ego-ruled <coughs> world is not the be-all and end-all. We are eternal beings, and we're just trying to cram ourselves into this world that isn't really a fit for us. But while we are here, we are remembering and relearning who we truly are, all the lessons, be they full of pain, be they full of pleasure, they're meant to remind us we are the light of the world. Our bodies are to be used in that way to communicate life and love. We're all teachers of God, which means that we should be about the business of teaching love and joy and peace and compassion in everything we say, everything we think, everything we do. Be careful, though. The ego, it's a little wily thing. It's going to even try to hijack this higher thought, Goldsmith says. He says, if you and I believe we are expressing love, we are holding ourselves in the parentheses. We think we can love the world. Ha. You're just in the parentheses. If, on the other hand, we see that love is expressing itself through us, Life is manifesting and forming itself and consciousness is unfolding and disclosing itself in infinite form and variety, then we are lifted out of the parenthesis and moved into eternity. So this is a warning not to take pride in your spiritual growth, jubilance, because your ego is going to try to take credit for that and make you believe that you are better than others because you're doing your work. You're not. Remember, A Course in Miracles tells us all the children of God are special and none of the children of God are special. We are here to do our work. We are here to have our experiences. We are here to learn from them and then teach that power of love and mercy and compassion in every moment to everyone we meet. It's the ego's eyes that sees itself as expressing love. Here I am. I'm loving the world. But that's just holding us in the ego's power. So I invite you this morning. Join the resurrection by seeing eternity through your infinite eyes. This is the moment where you set your ego aside and you allow love to shine and communicate itself through you. And that love takes many forms, jubilance, and none of it comes from our egoic striving. It only comes when we stop allowing the ego to keep nailing us to the crosses of fear or shame or grievance and blame, and instead we surrender to the resurrection of God's Holy Spirit through us into the world. So that is the invitation of Easter this morning, Jubilance. Lay down your life of ego so you can take up your life of eternity, which is the continuous now. We are free, of course, says the punchline. We're free to keep crucifying ourselves as often as we like, and we're going to do it. Ten minutes out of here, you're going to go, why did I do that? <laughs> Nail yourself to a cross. There you go. And when those times come, go, look, I, that's the millionth way I've figured out how to crucify myself. The only message of the crucifixion is that you can overcome the cross. That means you can lay down your life of ego. You can release your judgment. You can release your blame, your fear, your shame, your grievances. Release 
jubilance, your recalcitrance. Once you lay it down, you can pick it back up anytime. Crucify yourself all you want. We often do. Because the ego's pull, it is just so strong within these parentheses. But it's only by starting the practice of touching this field of eternity, even just for a moment in time, that we begin to loosen the ego's grip. We do this. We enter this field of eternity by adjusting our perspective. to Stop seeing through these eyes of flesh and see through our infinite eyes. And if we practice this long enough, jubilance, we'll be just like George. And everyone who looks into our eyes will see their own eternity staring back at them. And that is something that makes the whole world say, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs>